All right. Now, uh, in the story, the point where we stopped, you were talking about uh, getting, I guess, learning to fly different kinds of helicopters. We were doing a larger well, helicopter. They, yeah, we, we were, when you're qualified when you finished helicopter school, you're only qualified in the one, the H-23. And uh, so at Fort Huachuca, we were 5,000 feet above sea level. Most of the helicopters wouldn't fly at that altitude in those days. And they had this, one or two H-19s and uh, an H-21, which was the, the old banana boat. And so they were arranging uh, a transition, you know, to qualify me and the other couple of guys that had gone to helicopter school at the same time, uh, to get us qualified. Then. And that's about the time that the wall went up in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And so everybody got, not everybody, but a heck of a lot of us got transferred. I got transferred to Fort Benning to join the 2nd Infantry Division. And uh, the first three or four months, was getting ready to go to, to uh, Cuba. We uh, practiced and studied. Uh, I learned, I got transitioned into one of the clunkiest helicopters, a Bell H-13. It was, a, it was one of them bubble jobbies with a 200 horsepower engine, and it had nothing. And, but they had all they had, was old clunky stuff. They had several H-19s and a couple H-34s, Nobody could fly them. So they took these helicopter only guys and qualified them in, in the helicopters that they had. And eventually me and these other jokers that were fixed wing rated, uh, we would get qualified in, in those. Uh, but now after three or four months, things quieted down. The Cuban missile thing was all over with. Meantime, we had made a couple of trips to various places in Florida where they were going to situate us. We joined Key West, sit down there in Key West for a while. And then we went to uh, several places uh, along the Gulf Coast, uh, mostly near Eglin Air Force Base. And then we went to uh, up the coast. Oh, yeah. we called it uh, Cape Carnival. <laughs> That's what we called it. <laughs> and we used to fly uh, along, patrol the beach. In case uh, one of their, some of the stuff they were firing was little, little rockets. And uh, sometimes uh, they would go out beyond the uh, beach, go out into the water, and we'd try to locate them for them. Uh, we could see lots of sharks, not too far from, from mm -hmm. the beaches too. And so that, 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 that was interesting. Uh, then we, we went back to uh, to uh, Fort, ben Fort Benning, and uh, several of us, since we had been instructors at other service schools, like me at Fort Sill mm -hmm. and uh, Fort Bag, and he uh, turned us over to the infantry school and made platform instructors to teach them various subjects, mm -hmm. mostly Army aviation type things. And like I say, I enjoyed that. I can talk, 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 talk. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, oh, I got orders from there to go to Germany because uh, I, I did not like Fort Benning, did not like Fort Bragg, even though I've been at Bragg a couple of years. Why didn't you like Fort Benning? Oh man, there was nothing going on really. It was, it was, uh, they were still like just like Fort Bragg. They were still fighting World War II. And everything was airborne, airborne, airborne. Mm -hmm. They had the parachute drops and all that sort of stuff. Uh, did not impress me. So you had an airborne. Well, we had it was they had an in, infantry OCS was there. In, infantry OCS, uh, yeah. as well as a non-com school and in the second. They had division. A, they had the ranger school, part of the yeah. ranger yeah. school. <coughs> the part of the ranger school was done there, and then it was sent down to uh, to um, oh heck. Uh, Eglin Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and they put them out in the swamps down there. Snake eaters, that's what everybody mm -hmm. called them. <laughs> they, uh, anyhow, I, I enjoyed that. Like, we taught mm -hmm. classes there for a while, and uh, we worked in a buddy system. Two of us, you know, would take on so much, and we'd, we'd go and he'd teach one, you know, one part of the class, and I'd teach the other part of the class. It was, it was good. It was better than sitting around twiddling your thumbs and painting 
Mm -hmm. yeah, most of my troops ended up painting equipment. Yeah. I wanted to do something. Okay. What was your official? I mean, did, were you with uh, an observation unit within the second division? Oh, no, no, that was long gone. Was okay. there, yeah, when I left Fort, uh, when I left Fort Bragg, I was out of the observation outfit. That's when I was going yeah. to went to Fort Sill to go to OCS. Yeah, but I mean, you were, but you still, you were, but you were. But when you were flying the aircraft, you were flying and things like that earlier had been observation aircraft. Oh, and, no, that, that's what they... With a fixed that, wing. That's what I mean, they were considered as a spotter yeah. plane, yeah. But then, but then with, a heli and with the helicopters, I mean, some of the ones that you had were also observation helicopters, mm -hmm. but, but you had everything now? You, you did. Well, I wasn't even... In, I hadn't even gone in... Before I went to OCS, I'd never been in, involved with aviation. Right, right. We're talking now, But now you, you've been through OCS and now you're at Fort Benning. Uh, and you are flying different helicopters yep, and things and like that. Yes. Um, but they but they didn't have sort of an observation unit that you were part of. They just stuck no, you in different they, places. No, they, they put us. For, they, they, I was glad that they put us out as instructors. Mm -hmm. I, I felt content with that. But otherwise, like I say, my troops are painting rocks. Mm -hmm. You know, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. But now you get orders for Germany. Go to uh, yeah. Go to uh, Fort Sill to go to advance what they call a career course. Mm -hmm. And then from there to Germany. Now, what did the career course consist of? That's uh, advanced artillery tactics and techniques. Is this what you would get to get you promoted to captain, basically? No, I was already, already captain. a captain. Yeah. Okay. But it would be one of your requirements for major along the mm -hmm. way. Okay. And so anyhow, uh, Germany, like I said, we got there and lived in the village. I made a lot of friends in the village. My daughter was born there. When did you get there? Was that June of '63. Okay. And my daughter was born in August. <laughs> there you were just, and then uh, you were talking some off camera about that assignment, but we haven't recorded that part yet. So okay, so where were you sent to, and what was your job? Uh, well, I was sent to uh, Würzburg, which was a city of a hundred thousand, and it uh, we had the airfield that says Flugplatz. I don't know what that was called. Schenken, Flugplatz, Flugplatz Schenken term. The tower was the term. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyhow, it, it was ruins of about a 500-year-old castle. Mm -hmm. and it's there and still had the tower. They had rebuilt the tower. Uh, one side was uh, the military. I had the uh, beaver uh, and a uh, bird dog and an H-13 helicopter. I had uh, a hangar. And inside the hangar, I had tool rooms and so forth, spare parts, what have you. I also had a little fire. I call it a fire truck trailer, and uh, in case there was ever an accident and needed fire, but it wasn't. It was. It was all those like big acetylene tanks. They were with uh, some sort of chemicals. I also had uh, a bit of a weather station there where I had anemometers up above, and and I had thing in in the office where I could get the readings and and kept news to that. Had a had a direct line to uh, oh Kitsigi, no, that's not right. Direct line to Heidelberg, where they had a uh, I guess a major operation center you could call mm -hmm. it. You uh, were going to be flying local. You, if you were flying local, which you had local agreements with the other airfields in your area, where you could go there, just tell them you're coming, going to be there for an hour or two, and then coming back. So you you flew them, but then if you were going to fly outside of that outside of that local area, then you had to file a flight plan, or if you were going instruments, you had to file a flight plan, and that was done through Heidelberg, and it it, it worked good. I had like I said nine or ten troops, most of them were good, but only one had been trained in aviation. The other ones I picked up because nobody knew what to do with them. A couple of motor motor sergeants. Had one of the best motor ended up with one of the best, one of the best charge sergeants for maintenance. He'd been a motor, motor sergeant for about twelve years, and he he was an E five, which at that, at that time he was like a specialist. Uh, but he knew the the paperwork, the ins and outs of maintenance, army maintenance. Mm -hmm. Now whether it's an airplane or a jeep, it all follows the same same pattern. And uh, anyhow, headquarters called. I got an extra extra motor sergeant. He looks like he's half asleep. I said, "Oh boy!" He says, "Can you use him?" I said, "Yeah," because I was short of people. Let me let me talk to him. 
So they set him up and talk on if he didn't. Droopy, droopy eyes, and I said, holy jeez. Maybe this guy could fall asleep standing up. I don't know. I talked to him. This joker knew more than he had more packed away up there. I said, okay, what do you know about airplanes and helicopters? His attitude was the same as mine. Sir, if it's got a manual, I can do it. Mm -hmm. and so we got into some of the books and worked about this and that and this and that. Went out and pushed the airplanes around a little bit, opened the, the uh, cowling and so forth, looked around. I said, well, what do you think? you like to work for me? He said, yes, sir. This is just what I want. He was going to be the senior. Mm -hmm. He was going to run either the eight or nine other troops. And uh, he had his family, and they lived in a, in a village. Uh, he had two or three kids, and his uh, natural his wife. He didn't want to live in government quarters. But he has uh, good friends in, in the German village, mm -hmm. and so he took care of the troops that lived in the barracks. Their areas were clean all the time. He he handled them just the way he was supposed to. He took care of those books. The next time we had a big IG inspection, which was. When, when the jokers are supposed to come in and make you shake in your boots. He, he the born officer in charge, he says, boy, you got a good sergeant there, don't lose him. I know. <laughs> uh, you're, you're talking, you've only got a handful of men, but don't you have a lot of kind of specialized needs? If you've got aircraft, someone has to maintain That's them. Right. We, we, later on I did get one who was trained on the beavers, the fixed wing. Mm -hmm. But I, I, initially I got one who was changed, uh, who, well, he was there. He was on the rotary wing on the H-13, H model is what we had. He had he had, had the school, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, to be on the safe side, Steve, which was the lieutenant that worked for me, Steve and I, one or the other, would be up there with him, working with a wrench in our hand. This bothered me not. I'm a car nut to begin with. I, you know, mm -hmm. tool spot don't bother me a bit. But my little troops, I had good troops. I had one or two. They tried to give them to me. I told them to take them back. I don't want them. <laughs> now, were, were you the only pilot? Or? I was dual rated. Steve was dual rated. He had mm -hmm. just finished flight school. He was a National Guardsman from Utah. And uh, he had finished flight school and he was rated both fixed wing and helicopter. But all he had was helicopter school, which was the H 23. So we made arrangements for him to get qualified in the age 13. <coughs> so. Is that your phone? Some of his phone. Sorry. I thought I turned it off. Anyway, All right. Anyhow, uh, y'all set? Yeah, yeah, we're still, got, we're still rolling here. Yeah. Sorry. Well, with Steve, he, uh, I just turned it like off. I say, he, he was Utah National Guard, and he had just finished. Uh, helicopter training. He had only been out of flight school for about two years, but he had a good assignment where he had a lot of fixed wing time. Mm -hmm. I mean, three or four hundred hours like that, you know. And uh, so we, we worked with it. He ended up, they gave him his own airfield a little later on. Okay. Now, what were your actual missions when you're flying with your job? Uh, well, emergency uh, resupply, I guess you could call it. We had these Hawk missile sites all up and down the East German and Czechoslovakian border from Bad Tolts in the, in the Alpines and in, in, the, uh, in the Alps. Bad Tolts was uh, from there all the way up to the north side of Castle, which, uh, oh geez, that's far. pretty far north, about two thirds of the way yeah. up, up the country. And uh, but we had these missile sites. And every now and then the electronics or the missiles themselves, they had a couple blow up on the, on the launcher a few times, but anyhow, if there was ever a, an emergency, these things had to be operational all the time. And we had quite a stockpile of parts. Most of the parts could be fitted to uh, either the helicopter or but the big ones that had to go in the airplane. The Beaver was a utility plane and it would carry quite a bit. And so would middle of the night they could call you. We need such and such and such and such. So they go take it, they take it to the airfield, put it in the airplane, and away you go. Okay. Either Steve or I would do it. We rotated. He was a good guy to work with. We worked together real good. Did you do any sort of border patrol observation? We didn't know. Like we did nothing like okay. that. Although flying that East German border was, was a, a little bit because it was rugged terrain. 
all hills and mountains and valleys. And you, know, you ever heard the expression IFR, I follow rails? <laughs> That's what I did mm -hmm. several times. Follow the train tracks. <laughs> Would you ever see uh, East German or, or Soviet aircraft out there? No, mm -hmm. no, but there were several reports that uh, Czechoslovakia, they would come flying towards the west, two, you know, like two jets, mm -hmm. heading towards the west, and the balloon goes up. Everybody's figuring something's going to happen. The balloon's going up. The, the attack is going to be made. Well, they get to the get to the border and they turn turn up, just turn away. It's, but I, I didn't see any of that. When I was uh, I was fortunate, got a chance to go into Berlin, so I got to go into East Berlin, mm -hmm. and uh, somewhere. I've got movies that uh, the East German guards guarding the uh, the tomb, or the I guess of the German people, goose step, mm -hmm. World War II German type uniforms, and the goose step. Boy, boy, them shiny boots and the goose step. Uh, I got them somewhere. But then also uh, the Russians had their people outside of the Brandenburg Gate. Uh, they had a memorial there, and they had a couple of Russian soldiers on guard all the time. Then they had this great big area where it's all covered with concrete, and it's all the, the Russians killed in the Berlin battle, and the, the statue of Mother Russia on the end of it. I, I did get into some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they also had, they had a thing, I can't recall what it was called, but uh, part of the agreement, I guess, you know, that after WW2, <clears throat> American representatives or French representatives or Russian representatives can travel to the other uh, other areas that are controlled by the other allies. Right. And anyhow, uh, I was scheduled to go. And they had me all briefed, but for some reason it, they they changed it. But I did luck out and get that. Took the night train to Berlin. I have another little thing. I was I was a quite a, quite a smoker in those days. And I was smoking cigars. And we stopped, uh, I think it was Potsdam, just before you cross into East Berlin, or, or into West Germany. But we had to stop two or three times during the night, and we were not supposed to look out the windows. But, uh, old John, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we go by some of these little towns and so forth, and you see people sitting around the table, like we are, one twenty-five watt light bulb, and whether they're playing cards or BS, and I don't know, but you could see that. But as we, whenever we would stop, where they would reload the the train, or the coal car, or whatever, uh, or change the crew, they kept changing the crew from from West Germans to East Germans and back and forth. There's a Russian soldier, but every twenty twenty-five feet along the platform. Well, and boy, these jokers were sharp. They looked sharp, they had sharp uniforms. And Steve, Steve Frankel and I, one of my buddies, and the windows went down, so you could lean on the window and look out. We weren't supposed to try to talk to the uh, Russians, but Steve and I both smoked cigars, same kind as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. So we're puffing and the smoke is going and gets close to that one Russian troop. And I saw him, and I just happened to catch it, <laughs> sniffing that cigar tobacco smoke, you know. And I thought to myself, hmm, what if I was to get off and offer him a cigar? Because these guys were not kids. They were like in their twenties. So as we were getting ready to move on, I took the cigar, it was in the, you know, in the cellophane wrapper. I don't even remember, oh, Antonio and Cleopatra's they were. And so I looked up and down a little bit, and I flipped the cigar so it landed close to his feet. And he looked up and down, and looked up and down, and he read the cigar. No. <laughs> so I've often wondered if he enjoyed it. <laughs> now, when you went into uh, East Berlin, um, did you? what did that look like relative uh, to West Berlin? It was a dump. Still piles and piles of rubble. And now we had, we went, you know, uh, Oh, there was about four families of us went. And we had our kids with us too. And like I said, my son was about eight or nine years old. And uh, 
I took some movies. I, nobody said I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, wore, you had to wear a uniform. And every, the bus driver advised everybody. There were several other guys in uniform. Uh, let the let the American military hold your stuff, your money and so forth, uh, in your pockets, even your passports, American passports. So your pockets are bulging out with with all this. And uh, if if a East German guard was to say anything to you, your answer was that you only spoke one. You could only speak to a Russian officer. Ich muss ein Russian officer. And. Uh, when, oh, we're going just to, they changed drivers again on the bus. And they had a girl who was telling us all about the, the benefits of living in East Berlin. You know, so many weeks work uh, to qualify for a dress. And, and you looked at the people, the men's pants, the pant legs were that big around, not, not bell bottoms, just mm -hmm. full length like that. Mm -hmm. Wrinkly, it looked like they slept in them. We're in a suit coat that was 30 different colors from the original one that it started with. Uh, the girl was good. She gave you a good briefing and told stories, but she made up half of them, I think. But as we're going along, my son says, Dad, I see the kids playing on the side streets. Yeah. Yes. Oh, he didn't say exactly side. Dad, there's kids playing over there. And I said, yeah. So he says, they don't have any toys. He's right. They, Wooden balls, they were playing like bowls, you know, wooden balls. No, no baby dolls, just little girls, no push carts, no, no baby dolls. And uh, I start watching, when he mentioned that, every time we went by certain areas, I would look, sure enough, the kids didn't have anything to play with. And they were dirty. The kids were dirty, uh, the streets were dirty, piles and piles of rubble. And that had seven years, well, I know more than that. Yeah, I mean, you're, 15 you're making years. the 60s, yeah. <clears throat> 15 years, uh, and then all them big piles of bricks. <clears throat> and they had people working on those big piles. One joker up top throwing one brick down at a time. And a uh, guy down below would catch it and hand it to somebody else. And they'd put it in the back of a truck, the truck would go away. This carried on for several blocks. You know. uh, we could not ride the U-Bahn, which was the, sub, uh, the uh, subway. Mm -hmm. There was a subway, but it was run by the west side. We could ride that. And uh, we went to several, several nice restaurants. And then Unter den Linden, the, the main drag, where it runs right up to the Brandenburger Tour. Uh, oh, some beautiful coffee shops. Sit there and a snack, a little sandwich, or, or a couple of pastries and a <coughs> cup of coffee. Great. And, and, and you ask, how were the German people? Great. Mm -hmm. They were They were very, very... Well, the night that Kennedy died, got killed, mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I had gone to the officers' club. We were going to have dinner. We were going to meet another American couple and a couple of German couples. We'd made German mm -hmm. friends. Uh, and go someplace downtown. There were several nice, call them nightclubs, mm -hmm. little floor show kind of thing. And uh, we were having, we had just got in and we had got our dinner and a dinner, we had just finished dinner. The commanding general of the area, he was there with his staff and they were sitting off to one, one side of the big dining room. He, he was there and he had uh, whoosh, maybe a dozen, dozen of his staff officers with him. Well, a German waiter came to me and told me uh, that the German radio was talking about Kennedy being assassinated or being shot. That's all mm -hmm. it was at that time. So uh, he says, I said, well, Wolfgang, tell General so-and-so. No, I couldn't do that. Okay. I went over and told the general. You seen the look on his face. I said, sir, excuse me, it's Captain Mary, 69th Artillery. German radio says President Kennedy's been shot. General perked up like anything and he started to so-and-so, so-and-so, he had already had ideas of what to do, you know, because he'd organized it, I guess. And one of the colonels, I, I knew, I didn't know him, I didn't see him the first time, otherwise I'd have gone to him, mm -hmm. chain of command, you know. But the, the general, uh, later on, my commander decided to get married and I was his best man. This was a couple, about two years mm -hmm. later, maybe. Uh, 
the general, he was still the same general. He says, you know, I wish I could have stole you away from them. You're too good a guy, you're too good a guy to be in, in, a, in an artillery outfit. I said, sir, I'm the aviation officer. <laughs> But it, uh, it, was, it was very good. Uh, like I say, I knew so many German people. We would, uh, when, weekends, like Steve and I used to alternate, who was going to fly, you know, if, if, and so if, if there was any missions came, we already had, always had somebody ready. I had troops that would stand by too, in or near the barracks, uh, because uh, we'd have to get the airplanes out or whatever. The, uh, the 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 thing was good. We were oh, we we were getting invitations to any any of these big functions, and there's nothing, nothing, like a Schweinakoff party. Pig's head, and that's just what it meant. Mm -hmm. Boiled, pig's head. Captain Barry, can you and Lieutenant Stevens come to our Schweinakoff party? It's Friday night. Uh, one, one of us, oh, how was it? Oh, the weather, it, we, everything was grounded. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to, we couldn't fly anyhow. And so, hair up, he was the guy uh, in charge. Uh, and I said, well, what's the Schweinakoff party? And he said, oh, we drink and we eat uh, Schweinakoff, pig's head. It's good, the best thing, it's a specialty. <coughs> so, Steve and I, we go to this party. And everybody's got a platter about this big. First thing they did is stick a glass in your hand about that tall, full of straight vodka. So you take <laughs> And then beer. You had beer and vodka to drink. And uh, anyhow, they got this big, I mean, a pig's head like this. And they're slicing it. The women, they, they have the, the, the cooks or whatever. Anyhow, they're slicing it. And so you get a bit on your platter. You got a bit of skin. You got a bit of brains, you got a bit of meat, you got teeth, you got everything. A big blob of sauerkraut, new potatoes, great big boiled potatoes like that. Oh, they were good. Steve and I looked at each other. <laughs> we ate it. We ate that, that Shrinikoff, that pig's head. No sooner got it finished, had gonna, I was thinking to myself, boy, I'm glad I got that down and it stayed down. Plop. <laughs> Put another piece. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not was not my favorite thing. It was not my favorite thing, but we did it and we upheld the uh, honor of the United States Army. <laughs> now, when Kennedy was assassinated, I mean, did you guys go on alert or what happened well, after that? Yes, we had a, an alert, but nothing. It was a very low alert. But what surprised me is, like, we were supposed to meet this German couple at a place downtown, or one of the German couples, and, and uh, Tony, the, the other guy, uh, he and his, his wife were supposed to go with us. Uh, I called Tony and uh, told him, you know, I just got this word that uh, I, he, or Kennedy had been shot. So Tony says, yeah, we just got it ourselves. He was field the field officer of the day or something, so he was on a, mm -hmm. a chain of notification. And uh, I said, you're still going to go to some, whatever the name of the place was? He said, no, I don't think so, because we're probably going to go on alert. So I tried calling the German couples, and I couldn't get an answer. So I figured, well, I'll go to the first place, and one of them will be there. And, oh, they were, they come running to meet us, you know, we pulled in the car. And they grabbed my hand and shook it. They're so sorry about Kennedy being assassinated. The, the, the woman was crying. They loved Kennedy. And, uh, but they, they contacted the other German couple mm -hmm. because there was no idea. We weren't going out. So uh, anyhow, we went, we went back home. But they were, that impressed me, that they were so sorry that Kennedy had been assassinated. Because when it was not wasn't about two or three months before he had been in Berlin. He should be in any Berlin or... It was was his saying, mm -hmm. and uh, they took that seriously. I'm a, I'm a Berliner, and but they really that that, and it was for days. I'd bump into a German acquaintance or friend, mm -hmm. even even the even the shepherd, 
so sorry about Pre President Kennedy. Now, you don't see that over here. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they did or not, but uh, you know, you, you know somebody that's died, you offer your condolences, but these are total strangers, walk up to you on the street, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, now, you talked some uh, off camera about some of the aspects of life in Germany. Now, I think one part uh, in, in involved the shepherd, involved explain who he was and how you knew the I don't shepherd. remember his name, but he was a hedgehog good guy. Uh, <laughs> the Travel Rise Bureau, the Travel Bureau in, in, in Germany, is more or less run or controlled by the government. And the manager of the local area, Herr Raup, he has also had the responsibility that if there was any German airplanes or any other than a military airplane going to land at the airfield, he had to be out there, meet them, and, and uh, we could not let them stay overnight. Mm -hmm. they, they had to do their thing, drop off their passengers or pick up their passengers and, and take off. Well, uh, how was this? Uh, connection to the Shepherd. Yeah, well, anyhow, Raup, he was the guy I used to talk to, you know. Uh, we had a requirement that if there was an airplane that we didn't know was coming, a German airplane or a civilian airplane, if it landed, I had to call Raup right away. And either he or one of his reps would come out and take care of business. Uh, and he'd chew them out, too, because they're supposed to get prior permission. This uh, worked out, but anyhow, I'm talking to Herr Raup, and this is, uh, the grass is getting high and all that sort of stuff. And I commented, uh, I, I think one of them, my troops was with me or something. And, you know, I said, hey, Gerfen, call the engineers and tell them we need the grass cut. And Herr Ruff said, oh, we don't need that. I said, whoops, well, we look at it, it's so high. He says, here, so-and-so, he'll take care of it. Coming around the mountain, herd of sheep. <laughs> And those things were in no trouble at all. They never went near the airplanes or the helicopters with the engines running, the noise from an airplane or helicopter. Never phased them. They just chomp, 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 chomp. And he was so good, he had this uh, crook, a shepherd's crook. And on one end, he had like a, a, a trowel. And sometimes uh, a shepherd would get uh, uh, maybe diarrhea or it would... Uh, or a sheep. The yep. sheep would yep. get diarrhea. Uh, or uh, a bigger movement than normal. He would take that trowel, dig a little hole, shove it in, pat it down, <laughs> and in the grass. The ground was smooth, mm -hmm. uh, and he would come around about once a week. He had one dog, and he, the dog would uh, help handle the sheep for him. He lived in a little, I guess you could call it a little trailer, about four foot square, it looked like. <laughs> a little wooden uh, trailer, maybe uh, uh, big enough to have a bunk in it and a little stove where he could cook his dinner or whatever. He was a nice old timer, a nice guy, mm -hmm. really. And I guess he had quite a few bucks tied up in, in uh, that herd of sheep because there was shearing time would come along. And, but boy, he kept my grass nice. And everybody would come in you know, from another airfield. How do you keep your grass so good, John? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then. Uh, <clears throat> Tell the story about the glider club. Oh, the glider club? They wanted uh, the guy who was in charge of the airfield before I got there. They had been after him for several years because it was, they wanted to fly their glider, which is it's cheaper than flying a, an airplane, because it's, but the, to get the uh, glider off the ground, they had to use an airplane uh, because the damage, if they, in some places, they had a winch with a steel cable. And they couldn't use that on a hardtop runway because when the cable fell after being disconnected from the, the glider, it, it caused holes in the, in the runway. Well, I didn't have, uh, I had, all I had was a hardtop runway. Mm -hmm. I had dirt on either side of the runway, but the gliders were going to have to land on the hardtop. So we couldn't use a, a winch to launch the gliders. They were using a, oh, I can't remember what the heck, the name, oh, wow, that's not right, but anyhow, an old biplane from pre-World pre War II, mm -hmm. and the pilot would hook up and take off with a glider and cut them loose, come back in and pick up another one. And, uh, oh, heck, the airplane was named after a big German hero, 
from back in like the late 20s, early 30s. I want to say bull cow, but that might be, but it's not. Uh, anyhow, they, they would come and uh, uh, in order to qualify for a glider qualification, they had to fly from one airfield or they had to fly a certain distance. And they had to do this in, in, you know, in the air, naturally, or a glider. So there were several other small airfields like mine that they, uh, uh, they could also, they, they also flew gliders. Some had to, some could fly with a winch and some could fly with a, an airplane like we did. And uh, so anyhow, they would take off. They were supposed to tell us that they were coming, that there was a glider due at a three o'clock or something like that. Sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. You look up and here's a glider landing, you know. So we never had any close calls, no trouble at all. Like I say, they, they, were, they were so uh, happy about being able to fly the gliders off of that little airfield. Uh, they, were, they were good people to work with. And, uh, oh, you know, you, every, every German town of any size has a fest, festival. And uh, the big one in Würzburg was the Kiliani, St. Kilian, St. Kiliani Fest. So uh, the first time the fest was on, uh, the wife and I, we decided we were going to go check it out. And I don't recall whether we had an, another American couple with us or not, but I think we did. Yeah, we did. So in the meantime, we had lived in the village for about three months, but we had moved to government quarters. They wanted me in government quarters. I would have stayed in the village. <laughs> but the, uh, the government quarters uh, was one of the best in the area. So, but we, uh, we went down to the Chiliani Fest, big, beautiful carnival. I mean, they had stuff they don't even think about for carnivals <laughs> over here. And uh, we go into this beer tent. The beer tent's about the size of an airplane hangar at, at, at Detroit Metro. I mean, it's the biggest tent you ever saw. And uh, inside, row after row of like picnic tables, and they're end to end to end to end. I don't know, I have thousands of people, probably thousands. Um pa pa band at this end, um pa pa at the other end. I get the fat ladies up there, they'd be singing, oh, pa pa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was a fun thing. As anyone walked in, oh boy, the place is packed. I don't see any seats. Hey, Captain Barry, here's my old buddies again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Come on, we got seats. I, I looked over, Jesus, everybody crowded together on this big picnic table. And they said something to somebody down the end, and all of a sudden everybody shifts. Two guys get fallen, fall off the end, and they make room just like that. <laughs> My old German buddies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to be nice to your hosts, I guess. Oh man, it pays off. And uh, the uh, the beer, the great big steins, you know, was that like at, at that time you talked about the value of the, the Canadian French, and. Uh, uh, four, four, four marks to a dollar, quarter, mm -hmm. a beer, a quarter, big liter and a half at least. Mm -hmm. uh, big pretzels about that big. Oh, they were good. Lots of sea salt on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, oh, there was something else that stuck in my mind. It just flashed through. Oh, they had. You could have your choice of either a glass stein or a stone stein. That's where the Stein bit comes mm -hmm. in, yeah. And, uh, and for that quarter, you got your beer, and you could keep the Stein. So I went to several other fests, you know, that were within driving distance on the weekend. And uh, I had quite a collection of the Steins, and then there were some fancy ones, too. Mm -hmm. Paid a little extra for those. No. My uh, ex uh, didn't think I needed them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um... How long were you supposed to be in Germany? When three, you... three years. Okay, and how long did you wind up staying? Uh, about two and a half. Okay. I, I got there in uh, June of 63 and left about the middle of October of 65. Okay, uh, and so what led to that change in plans? I had over 12 days to get to Vietnam, to join a unit to go to Vietnam. Okay. I had to go to Fort Bend <coughs> and get, make sure my shots were updated. They were all updated. I always kept them up. Uh, Oh, a couple of minor paperwork, mostly paperwork, insurance <laughs> papers and so forth. We finally got our insurance paid for again. You know, it came and stayed with us for a while, and then it was taken away, and then now they can't take it away anymore. 
So, uh, uh, so now you're. Then we, I'm trying to say, we had to, we had to get qualified in uh, uh, UIS. Mm -hmm. Now we had had a preliminary qualification in Germany. They sent us down for about four or five days, and so you got to fly maybe four or five hours in the UI. Initially, how to start it and how to how to drive it is a bummer mm -hmm. job. So when we were at Fort Bang, we did get to fly, and uh, we also <laughs> we also got to fly what they called a 540 at the time. It was it's now it's called a C model, but initially what it was it had a different rotor head and different blades, and it was faster. It would do 140 stripped, which most helicopters 85 90 miles an hour, and. Uh, but we had nobody that could quali was qualified to transition us into the 540s. Mm -hmm. And so somebody made a decision, ah, go fly it. So everybody's flying. You getting your time in? I loved that 540, that was great. <laughs> and we ended up, we lucked out and we had gun, our gunships were all 540s when we went to Vietnam the first time. All right. And uh, they, 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 they could outfly a lot of the other helicopters. Particularly the troop carriers, we we could outfly them. Okay, so about how long did you spend before Benning then? Ah, uh, we got there. Let's see. Around the first of November is when we got there, and we we left there about the middle of uh, December to go. We we were taken by air to uh, ha -ha, San Francisco, <laughs> and from San Francisco we were put on a troop ship. And which was a lot better than living in the point of the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a captain, a pretty senior captain by then. And so I got, I had a cabin. Of course, there was four other guys in the cabin. But I had a nice big wide bunk to sleep on. And they didn't have any sweat running off the walls. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, was your whole unit going together then? The whole unit. We had, uh, we had, uh, this was a, a two stacker. It was a bigger, I'm trying to remember what the ship's name was. It's there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyhow, we had to, uh, we had about 2,000 troops. Now some of them were going to the 25th Division in Hawaii, and some of them were ours, and some of them were some miscellaneous units. We had, uh, oh, 30, 40, we had maybe 45, 50 officers, well, officers and warrant officers. And so, uh, we stopped in Hawaii and we dropped off uh, some of those troops that were going to the 25th Division. And we picked up a bunch of troops in Hawaii. I don't know whether they were 25th Division or not. So we, we uh, took them and we were halfway to Vietnam when there was a, <laughs> another joker. They had to evacuate from the ship because he had ruptured his appendix and all kinds of infections. Mm -hmm. So we pulled into the harbor at Guam. And uh, anyhow, they brought a, a little boat alongside and, and uh, took this joker off. And he might have been really bad. He was all wrapped up. Anyhow, they put him on the little boat and took him in. The way we went, we only were there an hour or two. Now, in Hawaii, they let us, the officers and senior non-coms, they let us go ashore for a while. The troops had to stay on board. And uh, we went to, me and my buddies, we went to the dining. Dynasty, Dy yeah, I think it was called the Dynasty, Japanese restaurant right there in, oh, on, in Oahu. I had good, good Japanese meal. There was a Chinese. That was good. But we had to be back by a certain time. And of course, your officers, you follow the rules. And uh, back on the ship, and we went to Vung Tau. It used to be Cop if You heard of Vung Tau. Yeah. <laughs> Cape, Cape Saint-Jacques, Bung Tau is uh, the Vietnamese name, and they unloaded us, <laughs> just like going to Incheon in, in uh, Korea, unloaded, loaded us, unloaded us because the water was so shallow, from the troop ship, great big, great big, uh, what the heck you call it, troop carrier. Landing craft? Landing craft, great big landing craft. They, uh, and he took us off, we got on, and we lined up, and uh, everybody got their gear, and uh, trucks, they took us, I'm 
trying to think where we went now. Um, he took us about halfway. I was north of Saigon mm -hmm. and Tuiwa. Tu no, not Tuiwa. Mm -mm. Anyhow, there was a base, had, had a couple of helicopter companies. He took us there, and from there, they loaded us on board some H 37s. Now, that was a helicopter with twin engines mm -hmm. that hung on the outside, clumsier than anything. And yeah, they took us to a place called Phuc Vinh, shacks. Mm -hmm. they, they had kicked a bunch of Vietnamese people and put us in these shacks. Bugs, bugs, rats. And that's where we were, we stayed there. And from there on out, the first week or two, we were building, building hooches, okay. building a place to live. Now, what was the unit that you were with at this time? 162nd Assault Helicopter Company. Okay. And uh, anyhow, we uh, also had to stand our own guard, which was no problem. Uh, I had taken a small set of binoculars with me, my, my own. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, even, in, even though, though they're regular binoculars, you can see a hell of a lot more at night than you could with just your eyeballs. So I, I, I'm on a position on the perimeter, and I got a couple of troops with me, and they got their rifles. I had my 45, I didn't have any ammo. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, I took my binox and I would check. We're looking out on the scrub, scrub, scrub jungle, I guess you could call it. And uh, then there was right next to us was a dirt strip, landing strip. And we didn't have any helicopters or anything then. So they took us, and, and well, we worked for three or four days fixing these hooches up so we could live in them. And then they took us uh, a couple of helicopter loads at a time. And uh, in the meantime, for killer, this is something that I had almost forgotten. I, I had been the transportation officer when I was at Benning, make sure that uh, all these Connex containers that was loaded with equipment and people stuff, foot lockers, make sure it was all loaded. Well, John, he knew what he needed in Korea so he had two foot lockers. He put them both in the same conics. In other words, we lost the conics. It, it, it dropped right in Charlie country. And uh, so I, I needed them socks and I needed that underwear. <laughs> it, what I should have done was split it up and put one foot locker in one conix and the other in the other. But that was sort of dumb. You learn from experience. So, uh, Anyhow, they, they took us by helicopter load, they took us down and they gave us an orientation. You know, what this and that is, what area this is, who's, on, who's controlling this, who's controlling that. In the meantime, you got a map. The map were overprinted Japanese maps from WW2. Mm -hmm. Same kind we had in, in uh, Korea. And uh, we were getting new maps, were coming in. And so, but they were better than nothing. And so we, we got qualified. Uh, we got sent out with, with uh, helicopters uh, from the uh, units that were stationed there. Tuiwa tu tu is not right. It must have come out. And. Uh, oh, there's. In Fuloi. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, Fuloi, <coughs> we went out and we flew a couple of missions with them. And as I said, we were working with, uh, well, this particular time, or one particular time, we were working with the 1st Division. And they had a. Uh, a brigade out there. They had three or four companies of infantry, and uh, they had cornered a bunch of Viet Cong. They captured a bunch of them, about 20 or 30 of them, all kinds of ammo and uh, all kinds of weapons and so forth. That was my first look at a Viet Cong. He was, his arms were tied behind him, and his uh, face was wrapped with three or four turns of cloth. He couldn't see, and they, had, they made him squat, and they were sitting. You walk close to him, and they tried to kick you. And uh, here's a joker, like I say, he can't see, but he can hear you walking. He tries to kick you from sidekick. And uh, you looked at the, all these weapons. Half of them were American. They'd been captured in Korea, early days of Korea, when the first cab evacuated. And uh, so uh, this is when, I, like I say, saw these weapons. 
Uh, I also saw my, the first Americans I saw wounded, and they had a, a more or less a, uh, uh, I guess you could call it a, an aid station. It was better than an aid station because there was a couple of doctors there, and they were doing some heavy surgery. And uh, like you say, you learn. So anyhow, they kept us there. We flew a couple of missions with the, like, since I was with gunships. They flew us uh, with their gunships, and they just pointed out some, some landmarks that you could easily find and where to go from there. So then uh, they flew a whole bunch of us down to Vung Tau again, and in the meantime our helicopters had arrived and had been assembled, test flown, and uh, all that. Of course, I test flew mine to make sure. <laughs> and so then we flew up to... Uh, uh, our place, well, our place, uh, Phu Pin, they, uh, the people, some of the people that had stayed behind there were uh, busy making some revetments to park their gunships in particular. So that, you know, the rockets would be pointing at, uh, at the uh, sandbags in case one of them went out, just from, mm -hmm. they would go off from static electricity. So we, we got them in there, and then we went back to work on our hooches, we went back to work on the revetments, <clears throat> then we started flying missions on our own. Sometimes we were moving a, a few troops and covering the troops. And in, in our case, we did a lot of recon in the first mm, two or three months we were there. And we're talking like uh, January, February, March, maybe something like this. And uh, you're looking for trails going through the woods. We, we worked hard at that, and you, you know you kept your, your maps up to date. And we did some damage. We did some heavy damage in some places. And of course, we had a couple of, I don't know what you'd call them, flyboys. There's one joke. We, we get scrambled because of the, oh, the, we were working with the Australians there, too. Uh, a group of maybe a platoon of Australians were getting cut off, were getting shot up. They needed pulled out of there. We couldn't get the slicks, which was the unarmed helicopters, we couldn't get them in unless we had to cover, the guns to cover them. So we had a couple of slicks and uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail, that's what it was. So we, uh, we went up and, uh, and really tore them up because we, these jokers figured they had, they're out in the open, ain't nobody gonna bother us. So all the bad guys were out there in the open, so we had two gunships, and we sprayed them with the machine guns, put a couple of rockets in them, and we had one with something new, and that was my baby. As a matter of fact, I got a picture up there, 40 millimeter grenade launcher on the nose of a helicopter, and uh, uh, you, you little thing like this. That's the warhead. I'll tell you another story about one of them, and. Uh, you could pop, 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 and they would go off, and for 30, 35 feet, it, it would tear you up. It, it, mm -hmm. you know, all, little, little bits and pieces of metal, like aspirin size. And this is what we would use on, on you know, personnel in the open. And, and the machine guns, the machine guns, your dispersion is too bad. But you can shoot up the area. Uh, so we got the Aussies out of there. They were also very good to work with. And they were, they were, professional soldiers. I worked with the Aussies quite, quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I say, we caused some damage. We tear up that, the, the, the Air Force would come in and drop napalm and so forth uh, along Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, and that was it. They'd make their run, bye-bye. <laughs> and uh, a little while later, the other, the Kong would start coming out of the jungle, take their bicycles and their backpacks and away they go. So, hmm? okay. <coughs> now, at this point, um, a lot of the activity, at least in the border country, was still being done by special forces, Green Berets, that kind of thing. They were, yeah, they were along the border. They were good to work with the, uh, the special forces. And also, we, we had uh, American officers out on at, uh, various uh, camps, which were, they were not special forces, mm -hmm. but they had uh, maybe a company, about 200, 300. Nungs, which were the local uh, uh, 
Native. Natives. The modern yards, the hill tribesmen. Well, yeah. yeah. But these, uh, they were paid, paid mm -hmm. troops. And they were uh, soldiers of fortune, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but they would uh, be in some of these camps. And now uh, we went on the first major operation with the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, somewhere is the name of it. But it was all along the border. And the bad guys were all on the Cambodian side. There was a little little stream running down the middle. And uh, they, they shot up everything. They crossed the doggone stream and started firing across the, the border at our people. General Le Pew. He says, gunships, get over there and knock them sons of bitches out. <laughs> and so now we're not supposed to cross the border. Mm -hmm. But hey, this guy's a general. Now he's, we're supporting his troops. He says, go, I'm going. <laughs> so anyhow, we crossed and shot them up and uh, took care of They had heavy mortars. Uh, and anyhow, we shot up the mortars. We shot up the troops up and down a few times. We used up all our ammo and all our rockets. And there was nothing coming out, so he says, okay, good. That's what the general said, <laughs> come on the radio. Good, took care of that. Get back on our side. <laughs> so we, phew, it almost came the name of that operation. That was one of the first ones. But that's when I learned uh, my, uh, what I liked about that 40 millimeter grenade launcher. That was when, when we were getting familiarized with the uh, helicopters back in the States. We took the 40 millimeter. They had a few helicopters, and we nobody had seen one. They, they had just got done putting them on, on the nose of the helicopters there at Fort Rucker, and so uh, we had sights, but the sights were never any good. So I eyeballed K Kentucky Windy, as you used to call it, mm -hmm. and I could pop them babies. And they had 50 gallon drums out there for tires. I was putting them in the 50 gallon drums, so I liked that thing. We used that uh, on that operation, and it's some pretty high trees. It was what they call triple level jungle. You had one level of trees, another level of trees, another level of branches, and anyhow. And they used to snipers would get up in there, take a machine gun with them, and try shooting at the helicopters. We uh, were where I had fun with those forty millimeters, forty mic mics. And I used to go up the tree trunk, boom, boom, boom. Sometimes blow the branches off, sometimes blow the tree down, and I got me a couple of snipers. <laughs> All right. Now, how dangerous was it to be flying the helicopter? You never, you never worried about it. I took 44 hits one day. Nothing serious. Holes in the windscreen, holes in the in the, in the uh, rocket pods. Now that's how I worried more about getting hit in the rocket pod. Mm -hmm. Holes in the belly. Hole come up by my feet, and there's, there's uh, where I got my Purple Heart. We were working, I uh, can't think of the name of it. Here is... <laughs> but here was Tain Inn, Mount, Mount Black Virgin Mountain. And a little village in between. Uh, the house that the, plant, the plantation manager lived in. Uh, the Americans were using that as the headquarters. And there was a little river, and they had worked to the north. They were working their way south. And uh, we were working with them, and we had come in to refuel and rearm. And we were out, and we were taking off. And my gunner, a crew chief, spotted a body floating down the river, one of ours, a friendly body. And so I called in and called down and told them that we got a body and where, how to get to it and so forth. So we vectored him down to uh, to get that uh, American body out, and we just finished that up, and we were going down the, the valley, the little call of valley. Wham! Bullet come through the floor. Now with that forty millimeter, we had a chute that ran next to the console, next to the pilot, the right hand seat. Bullet came through the floor, hit the primer on forty millimeter grenade. It blew the chute apart, blew the 40 millimeter. We had the base, and, we had, and the base was all shattered, but we had the warhead floating in air. I was flying with a brand new warrant officer, Kid Curry, I called him. He was a good kid. He lost an arm later on, I understand, but he was a good kid. Uh, anyhow, 
Guy says, get it out of here. Curry scooped it up and out the window. Whether it blew, I don't know. I could care less. It didn't blow in the helicopter. <laughs> well, anyhow, that's uh, when it had come through the floor. It peppered my left arm, uh, my part, even into my back. And uh, I didn't, phew, nothing, nothing to worry about. Just that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we went, we had to go and re yeah, we had to go re because we weren't going to leave when we were near a fuel place without refueling and, uh, and rearming to go because we had fired, we had fired the rockets, I think. Anyhow, we went in there. And there was a medic thing, right, because I just had brought some wounded in. And I'm blood. And so he, he writes a tag and takes a tag onto me, and away I went. So I, <laughs> and a couple of months later, they gave me the Purple Heart. I had uh, little, little pimples, I guess you'd call them, on my left arm, uh, my, my left shoulder, and a couple of bigger pieces. One piece looked like a dumbbell, round, round, straight connection in the middle. But for several years after, I could go like this and get a little piece of metal out, mm -hmm. break the skin. They, they were worked their way to the surface. And that's been quite a while now. You can't even find them. But then for a long time, if I got a suntan, I had all these little white spots where those little pimples were. Mm -hmm. they're, they're gone now. Lots of fun. All right. You, when, you, when you're in, <laughs> involved with something, you're too busy to worry about anything. Your job, you want to, I'm going to work with that guy on the ground. I'm going to support him. And tape number three is now. Okay, now we're talking about your uh, first Vietnam tour, kind of ended, I guess we're in basically 60, let's see, I guess you... We say the year of 66. 66, yeah, it was really 66, because you, you leave the beginning of 67. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you've talked some about, uh, so your job now, are, are you... Um, commanding a troop of helicopters? No, well, it's, it's a gunship, a gun platoon. Yeah, a gun platoon. And okay. we had uh, two, four, seven helicopters that were armed. Mm -hmm. Two of them had what we call an M16, which was four machine guns and two rocket pods. Two of them uh, had rocket pods, like homemade, what we ended up, with the 40 millimeter grenade launcher on the front. And the other one, I think we used that as a backup, and we would, if, if the others were in for maintenance, we'd take the gun kit off and put it on that one or something. Yeah. I don't recall that one, but we had, uh, but I, I know the maintenance detachment used it to haul some small parts. They more or less took it away from it. <laughs> All right. Uh, and now, were you attached to a particular division, or were you? We were not, no, we were, for, initially we were US, U.S. Army Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Then they formed the 1st Aviation Brigade. We became part of the 1st Aviation yeah. Brigade. So we were not assigned to any anybody else. We would be given missions to support, like the 1st Infantry Division, 25th Infantry Division, or even a battalion, or even a, a, a segment or a block of Special Forces camps mm -hmm. that may be connected to each other, but 10 or 15 miles apart, something like this. We may have supported them. Okay. Uh, and uh, talk a little bit about the pilots you had. Were they warrant officers or...? Most of the pilots were officers because at that time the warrant officer program uh, had been around. But they it was small classes. They, they, they graduated, you know, 30 or 40 or something like that. And some of them went on to uh, fly uh, both fixed wing and rotary wing. And uh, some of them ended up, uh, they had been promoted. And they had been uh, absorbed into, like, say, the instructor training group. Mm -hmm. And they were, some of them were experimental pilots and, you know, experimenting with, with different kinds of things. And they worked for, we, we had several units at Fort Rucker, that that's what their job was, was to uh, experiment with things, find out whether something could be good or something could or it couldn't be. And that's what, so we had several, older warrants, mm -hmm. but most of them, when they started coming in, most of them were W-1s, okay. which is like a second lieutenant. Right. So the regular Army officers, basically, and they've been through OCS and that kind of thing. 
Uh, the, the uh, commission ones. Yeah, commission ones. Yeah. As opposed to but now most of them, like 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 I, uh, we had been flying, or like we say, we I graduated from flight school, you know, first lieutenant. And so later on, I got to be a captain, but I'm still flying fixed wing, and in my case, rotary also. Uh, so some were strictly fixed wing, some were strictly rotary. So the rotaries, they filled the, all the vacant seats, is the way we referred to it, referred mm -hmm. to it. Filled the vacant seats with the, with the uh, people that were qualified in helicopters. And so they may not have ever seen another fixed wing again. <laughs> all right, uh, and how would you characterize your pilots as a group? My pilots, pretty doggone good. I was, they were good. The kids come out of training. And I shouldn't call them kids, because once, they're men. They're mm -hmm. men. This Curry, I, I liked He was a real nice young fellow, real smart. He, uh, uh, heck, he looked about 12 years old. But anything that uh, I needed, anything I wanted done, he was there. He would, I said, okay, you fly for a while. Go ahead. Hey, sir, look, there's something down there. And I looked. <laughs> but Curry was good. And uh, he was from Memphis, or Memphis area. We had another one. His name was Mendel Solomon. And Saul was from Houston, Texas. His family owned a jewelry store. I, I, I knew my kids. I knew mm -hmm. my pilots. And uh, now Saul had gone through the initial Warren Officer training program. And he had been called to active duty active duty as a warrant officer. Uh, about six months or so after we were over there, they uh, gave him a commission, made a lieutenant out of him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the, I, had, I had some good, good troop boy, Koshnik. He was built like a bull. He was great. Dog and Jeep ran over him. They probably had to throw the Jeep away. We were <laughs> sleeping, we used to sleep on the ground next to the helicopters. And we were working with uh, one of the, I think the first division. We were working with them and uh, we parked the helicopters so we're facing out outwards on the perimeter in case they tried to come and get us. All it took was get that rotor turning before you even got your RPM up and your hydraulics to make your guns work would work. So uh, anyhow, Koshnik, uh, well we're all sleeping next to the helicopters and I heard a noise, boom, boom, boom. And uh, crew chief, somebody ran over Mr. Koshnik. Somebody ran a jeep ran over Mr. Koshnik. Oh, geez, what am I going to do now? You know. So I'm I'm over there in a couple of steps, and he says, "What happened?" <laughs> <laughs> you just got run over by a jeep. You didn't get that son of a pup. <laughs> so anyhow, I, 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 how do you feel? <laughs> he said, "I'm okay." Everything's working, you know. Was the ground kind of muddy or whatever? You could get pushed <laughs> oh, it into was, it. It was a dirt, just a dirt thing. It wasn't muddy. But I had to send him to the, to the medics. Well, the hospital, the medics uh, on duty there. We better send him over to. They had a they had a hospital set up. Ah, uh, whether it was I think yeah it was over. They put a mash hospital up where Tain in near Tain in. So I had to call back to our headquarters and I needed a replacement pilot. Had to get Koshnik over to that uh, hospital. So the next day or next afternoon, whatever the case may be, I went over there to see how Koshnik made out because he was, who gets run over by a jeep? Not him. But he, he was built like a bull. He was as strong as an ox. Good kid, my kid. So and, uh, had he broken anything? No, nothing. When I got over there, <laughs> when I got over there, I talked to to the doc. I said, "How's Mr. Koshnik doing? He got run over by a jeep. He said nothing wrong with him." <laughs> we we x-rayed him, we poked, we prodded, he says everything's fine. So I got a hold of Koshnik and I, you know, I went over to where he was laying and he said something to the effect, hey, one guy get out of here, I gotta get out of here. I said, oh, we got so-and-so down to take your place. He said, well, I want to go flying again, I'm ready to go back. And I talked to the doctor again and the doctor said, yeah, you can take him, he's good. That was it. That was the end of it. We never heard another word. <laughs> now, helicopter pilots have something of a reputation for being wild men. No. Uh, I uh, heard. Fortunately, I, I uh, did not run into too much of that. Okay. The worst that I ran into was on my second trip. Uh, I think it was a warrant officer pilot. He was coming back from a mission, 
and uh, he had uh, maybe four or five people on board the helicopter, and there was a little, a little uh, railway overpass that had a little road going underneath it, and he decided to fly underneath it. He forgot the main thing, the coning out angle. You know, when those, those blades look like they might be straight, mm -hmm. but there's actually a cone, and the cone could be steeper and steeper, not necessarily the same all the time. So he flew under that uh, overpass and cut the, cut the rotor head off. I don't think anybody was killed. This happened just before I got there. And boy, I thought that was dumb. <laughs> all right. And how do they behave when they were on the ground? Uh, you have to step on them a little bit. Uh, most of them, they, uh, they knew they were allowed to have so much to drink and uh, it had to be controlled. They say you have two beers, that's it. And most of them followed that. They followed that rule. We, we had to establish some, some rules because some of them would sit there and drink it down. Uh, they were good. I, uh, I had very little disciplinary trouble with uh, any, any warrant officer that I can remember. I think it would have stuck with me because it was so, so few. I did not have any trouble with any of the pilots that I can think of. Okay. And what sort of impression did you have of the different sorts of Vietnamese that you encountered? The I mean, different types? Yeah, I mean, you had the Hmong mercenaries and so forth. There would be civilians, uh, South Vietnamese I military. Had, I did not have any direct contact. Uh, like, we would be into a Hmong camp, for example, and uh, some of them spoke English, and some of them spoke French. But it, it was, I, I had very little contact mm -hmm. with them. Usually we worked through the, you know, the counterparts, through the mm -hmm. Americans. And uh, we would fly supplies in. And... Uh, Did you encounter many Vietnamese civilians? No, the civilians, since they were, they were available, they were nearby all the time. I always told my troops to be very, very cautious, particularly with kids. Uh, because some kids had been caught, I don't know if you remember reading about the uh, uh, bicycle bombs, where they pack a bike with uh, the tubing on a bike with explosives and park it in front of a, an American headquarters or something, blow the front off the building. Uh, but they caught some kids putting hand grenades in the fuel tanks on the UEs. And what they do is they, they hold the uh, handle, wrap tape around it, and put it in the fuel tank. As it stays in there for a while, the tape dissolves and the handle comes off, boom, one, one helicopter goes by. And you know what happened in the air. And I made sure they understood that. I never had any trouble. But whenever there was kids, keep your eye on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, would you have villages nearby the bases where you were operating? We or? had a village, the, the village of uh, Phuc Vinh, <coughs> and where we operated from. Uh, and then, like, we were in and out of some of these other places that they might have a, a, even a Vietnamese camp, uh, you know, strictly Vietnamese troops. But their officers, most of them spoke English. They'd come to the States for training. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the Vietnamese were pretty good. I met some really sharp Vietnamese officers. And uh, I met some duds. And I equate Vietnam's army, the use of the U.S. Army Vietnam, no, that's Arvin. not right. Yeah. Arvin, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. I equate them in Vietnam as what the Korean army was like in Korea. Not very good. Mm -hmm. And in uh, uh, my, my connections, when I got to go back to the Koreans on my second trip, they were sharp. Some of the best soldiers in the world, the Koreans. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the Arvin units were great. They were good. And then you know, they got all their information out of the American training manuals. And they, they, were, they were good to work with. You could depend on them. Some of the others, goodbye. You, you, you wouldn't trust them as far as you could throw them. The Koreans did not trust the Vietnamese officers. Mm -hmm. And whenever they had a talk, Tactical Operations Center, 
whenever a Korean officer wanted to go into a Korea, or when a Vietnamese officer wanted to go into a, a Korean uh, tactical operations center, man, the blinds were down. <laughs> Block everything off. Show them only the area that we're working in. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't trust them. I don't blame them because there was a lot of them that were bad guys. Yeah, yeah there were a lot of them that were working for the other side. Yeah. Uh, and that sort of, okay. Yeah, uh, we broke up an attack on a special forces camp over, over north of Tainan. And uh, one of the bad guys, uh, he had an ID card for him being part of the urban. They took him out in the woods, that was all it was. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, you also mentioned. Let's see. You did you go into the bigger cities and towns? You go to Tainan or Saigon or? I, we were be in there for a reason. They were, they were technically off limits, mm -hmm. and we we uh, would go in. Now, some of the places uh, they would rent uh, a villa, like a big house, and we did, and uh, you paid so much a month, and you get to go down maybe once every once every month. Once every six weeks, whatever. And just a night, they got a good steak. Our boy had some good restaurants. Most of them were French trained. We had good restaurants. You can get a good meal that you hadn't had in who knows how long. And in one case, uh, <laughs> we had one of our guys who uh, he lived in. He was stationed in Alaska, and he met a bunch of people that worked for the Alaskan Barge and Trading Company, whatever the name was. Doggone, we bump, he bumps into one of the guys that he worked with uh, on this, on this uh, Alaskan barge. So we were trying to find a place to stay. We, we couldn't find a place to stay. This was before we, before we got that uh, villa. And so we spent the night on this barge. Beautiful air condition. Breakfast, four or five <laughs> eggs, half a pound of bacon. <laughs> and his... Uh, his two sons were about the age of my son, and when we were stationed in Fort Walters, Texas, they were buddy buddy. One of them is one of the pilots of that A that uh, B-17 that flies around the country giving rides. He's one of the pilots on that. All right, let's get a steer back here to the first Vietnam tour. Another story that you'd mentioned off camera had to do with dealing with uh, enemy mortar positions uh, and how you figured out how to deal with them. Well, well, you can see the trail when they. When they fired a mortar at nighttime, you could see this flame trail making the big arc because the mortar goes up and then it falls down. And we were coming up, uh, we were this camp, Tri B, was getting attacked. And then the commander, he was uh, hollering on the radio because it was a bad, bad attack. And now most of them, they had their uh, Vietnamese troops, plus they had their families, wives, and kids. And as we were coming up, I talked to the commander. And uh, he said, I don't know where they're coming from, but shoot the bastards, you know. <laughs> he was a pretty good boy. I liked working with him. Anyhow, uh, as we were going up, I could see the arc from the mortars. And they were firing four or six at a time. And these were big ones, like 80, say, say, equivalent of an 81 millimeter mortar. About this big, 35, 40 feet, anybody's going to get killed. And, and I had this homemade. Homemade rocket launcher, two of them, 38 rockets all told. And then we had the selector, and this was, it was a homemade arrangement. I selected four rockets at a time, figured I was going to fire it. Four, 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 and just go up the trail when all these, all these mortars are firing. Well, mortars or rockets are not supposed to have a recoil. Instead of getting four rockets at a time, I got 38 at one time. And I swear that helicopter stood still in the air. But as it was, the rockets kept going just the way they were supposed to. And I got a couple of explosions, what they call secondary explosions. They hit the ammo pile. Well, the next morning, uh, we landed at the camp there and talked to the commander. And he said, man, you did a job out there. They, they quit right after that, and you had 60 of them laying there. Yeah, they were gone by the mm -hmm. afternoon, by the way. Mm -hmm. they, they, they brought their... Yeah, they used to come in and get their bodies. Yeah. Yeah. The enemies would take away the bodies so you couldn't count how many of them there were. So if you were able to go out and count, that was an indication they got of how much damage they, you daylight, did. Daylight, they were out there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, now... Uh, this, before we forget, 
This is the 40 millimeter grenade launcher on the, on the front of a couple of the helicopters. Let's see if I can get that into the picture there. All right. Okay, now we're, I had no inkling, but this was uh, over there at Tain Inn where the Cloud Eye Religion, which is, consists essentially of a, the all seeing eye. They have a big globe with a great big eyeball, and you go into the temple, which is beautiful, and you see this eye is looking at you or anywhere else in the temple constantly. Uh, I had no thought, but I wanted some eyes. And I wanted some teeth. I wanted to paint that thumb gun up. So I painted some eyes, and painted the teeth. We did that, and that, as far as I know, when I left, they were still, still, uh, you know, whenever we had to replace them or whatever, we got new. They got the eyes and the teeth. <laughs> within within two weeks, within a week or ten days, we were getting reports, intelligence reports, that the uh, Viet Cong in that area were afraid of the helicopters with the eyes. Mm -hmm. Because the cow die eye, that's what they were equating it with the cow die religion. The eyes are everywhere; they're watching you. They were afraid of two things: the eyes on the gun on the gunships, and the ace of spades. The ace of spades was bad news; it was very, very bad stuff. And for a while, we got a whole bunch of ace of spades and throw a pack in them out every now and then. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, while you were in Vietnam, did you get an R and R? Yes, I. Uh, Went to, let's see, uh, the first trip I met my wife in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. They had the, uh, a special deal for air airfare, special deal for hotels, and, uh, well, we, it was over Oahu, it was great. Good restaurants, did a dumb thing though. I didn't know about it until I found out it was dumb. We rented a car. And you know we were driving different places because I, Hawaii is a nice place to visit. Mm -hmm. And we decided to drive around the island, and uh, every now and then stop and have a swim, because you could do it. The road's right next to the uh, ocean. And so we did this. We stop and take a dip, lay in the sun, get back in the car, and away we go. Go to the uh, uh, Polynesian Cultural Center, which had a very good meal. Uh, if you like poi. But that's not bad. This is for grits. <laughs> you learn to taste it. But anyhow, we got back, and we bumped into some people we knew. And he said, where you guys been all day? I said, well, we just took a drive around the, the beach, had a swim here and there. Uh, he said, why? Where, where'd you go? He said, well, we went to so-and-so and so-and-so. And he said, you did what? I said, we were over there. We went in, you know, took a, took a little swim in the water, and then come out and dried off. And took, he says, you know what that area is? That is where the tiger sharks have their mating r rituals every year. <laughs> never, saw a never saw a shark of any kind, let alone a tiger shark. But that's where the tiger sharks go to mate. Didn't know that. <laughs> that's what I say. Next time, if I ever do that again, drive around Oahu or any other of those islands, I'm going to ask somebody first. <laughs> right. okay. Yeah, you said first. Did you get a second R and R on that trip, or no? Okay, no, no. all right. Uh, I wanted. It, 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 there were some guys that got them. Uh, they they went to Australia. I would have loved to go to Australia, but I ended up. I had to go to Japan, and they. they I, how was it? She uh, couldn't. I, I guess it didn't extend to Japan. Mm -hmm. yeah, it could have been Hawaii. There's only so many yeah. so many seats or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in Tokyo, and it, it changed, you know, from, from the first time I was in Tokyo. It was interesting. I, I enjoy myself, and particularly when you can get to some of the old museums in Japan. They're fabulous. Boy, you'd love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, now did you have the same assignment during the whole tour in Vietnam, or did you change The, the first trip to Vietnam, I was in the 162nd, the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And like I say, we worked for all kinds of different people but we were still part of the same outfit. And sometimes we would go away and not come back for a week or 10 days. Uh, because, you know, you, you were gonna, you were gonna be working with this particular group and they had a particular mission and you worked with them directly. And when you were finished, they released you and you went back home. Now, did any of your people become casualties? We, we had uh, casualties, we lost, we lost one really. Uh, he was from, mm, Nebraska, Iowa, one of the farms I mm -hmm. farm, 
I understand he was an only son too, but he was an older troop. He had to be in his thirties and he had gone to the helicopter. He had been in the army for so many years and he had, uh, he had been, uh, he went to helicopter school and we had him for like three or four, maybe three or four months mm -hmm. and he took a bullet through the side and he never knew what hit him. <clears throat> we wore what they call a chicken plate, a breastplate. Mm -hmm. But and underneath that we wore a, a flat jacket, and uh, most of if you hit the flat the uh, breastplate, it stops a bullet. The flat jacket might slow it down if it hits at the right angle, but a direct shot it wouldn't slow down. Mm -hmm. But his his went right through the side. He never knew what hit him, and I wasn't flying with him. Somebody else was. But uh, I almost had his name. <laughs> But anyhow, I have wounds, another story. I mean, I, uh, several of my people, one guy had a close call, a bullet went right through here. And uh, we fortunately we were close to the hospital, called the hospital, took him in. And the doc pulled pieces of metal out. He said, he's okay, patch him up, away we go. <laughs> that sort of went past anything yeah. important. And yeah, it didn't. And well, it, it, it wiped the compass out. The bullet came through the compass before it hit him. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, now, to think about that first year in, in, in Vietnam, are there other particular things that stand out in your memory from that? Well, the, the thing that, that uh, got me was well, I would quit asking for permission. <laughs> Forget that. Uh, and nobody ever said words to me. We went on. We we uh, we helped the 25th Division move into. Coochie, mm -hmm. and uh, we were working with them when they started having people getting killed in the, at nighttime. They built their base camp over a, a tunnel area. The, the whole area was covered with tunnels, and they were living there underneath the, the, the good guys. And we worked with them. And what's this? Oh, Georgie Jessel. Do you ever? Do you remember yeah, Georgie yeah, Jessel? I do. Georgie Jessel came over there with a small uh, USO show, and he was where, at the 25th Division at, at uh, Coochie, and uh, he had a couple of, three or four people, and they had a little entertainment, and he was telling his corny jokes, and if you remember seeing him on TV, but he's telling his jokes, whap, he got hit in the, hit in the leg with a bullet, sniper, and he, all he, he lucked out, he just got a little groove. But he never missed a beat. He kept telling his corny jokes. And Georgie e. Jessel, he, of course, he's not around anymore. He came here. Uh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. 30 years ago. Part of uh, Uncle Milty, mm -hmm. Milton Burrell's review. Mm -hmm. He had the new ink spots and Georgie e. Jessel, Donald O'Connor. And they had it here in town. You know, mm -hmm. it cost you so much to go to it. And uh, it was the next day was Memorial Day Parade. And I led the Memorial Day Parade in the uniform for 10 years. And we, they were staying at the motel downtown. And uh, we we're coming up Pine Grove Avenue, which is the main drag. And this little guy comes running out, stands right next to me or walks along with me, Georgie e. Jessel. And now uh, he had it on his lapel Almost every outfit that he had entertained had given him a pin of some sort. And when we got to the end, to the Pine Grove Park where the end of the ceremony was or going to be or whatever, I asked him, how'd you make out with your leg shot, you know? He said, what? I told him, I said, oh yeah, I remember, that wasn't too bad. And they bandaged it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Martha Ray, she was over there the first trip. I just happened to luck out. I had to stop at some minor headquarters, an intermediate headquarters, whatever. And everybody's running in one direction. I'm finished with what I had, what business I had. And he said, oh, Martha Ray's here, Martha Ray's here. Oh, well, you know her? You remember her? You know, I know you're no chicken. You've been around for a I've while. I've been around so. long enough, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I remember her as being older yeah. on TV commercials, but yes. You know, she got herself a, a silver star. But anyhow, uh, uh, she was one of the funniest people I've ever seen or heard. She took that microphone and, and talked to it, talked to it, talked to it. She had Dean Jones with her, Frankie Darrow, which really goes back 
to the dead end kid days. And uh, who was the other one? Oh, Rocky, 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 Red, Red. Oh, anyhow, this big, big guy used to play supporting roles. He was like the, the sidekick to the to the dumb uh, policeman, or the sidekick to the sergeant in, in the uh, cavalry and all that. One of those supporting guys. Mm -hmm. He was there, and they, he and Dean Jones put on one of the funniest routines, talking back and forth. They were great to see. Oh, what the heck was his name? He still uh, every now and then I see him in a, in a late movie. <laughs> all right, I know you. Before you started talking about entertainers, you mentioned something in passing uh, about not asking permission. Oh, that was explain. When, explain that. Well, we were supposed to. If, if you got shot at or you spotted something, you had to call back. You know, you were in most cases you were within radio range of your headquarters. You had to call back, tell them where you were. You know, and I've got twenty guys out in the open carrying backpacks or whatever. But I've got a potential target. Hey, they're shooting at me. Okay, stand by. Twenty minutes later, you call. Hey, what's the answer? Twenty minutes later, what's the answer? Oh, you can shoot back at them now. Half an hour, an hour, or whatever. And uh, I says, where did you have to go for permission? Across the road to the Vietnamese headquarters. And then, so good. Next day I'm out, similar area. I, I tell you a funny one when I remembered this. But the uh, the uh, you get shot at, and whether he hit hit us or not, I don't recall. Yes, I think he put one through the rotor blade. And uh, anyhow, he shot. So brrr, we shot him up. Then I called him. Hey, I got a target. What is it? I got 20 guys in the open carrying backpacks. Oh man, hang on. 20 minutes later, he called back again. You get anything? No, we haven't got it yet. We'll get it. That was the last time I ever called for permission. Mm -hmm. And but the thing is, right in the same doggone vicinity, I could show you on the map if I had the map today. Early in the morning, a little hazy, a little fog hanging on the treetops, and we're heading for a, a mission. Probably up in the Michelin plantation area, and uh, we're flying. We come out, open this over this open valley. Eh, some trees on each side, but pretty, pretty wide down the center. And there's a wagon, not a wagon train, but a buffalo train. You got water buffaloes, about hmm, maybe eight or ten water buffaloes, tied nose to tail, with backpacks on them, and maybe half a dozen jokers prodding along. So I swung around, came up from the back, and I hated to do it, but I uh, figured you got to get those the prime movers, is what we called mm -hmm. them. And so I opened up, and uh, I held back a, a rocket on purpose, because when I got near the front, now these jokers that are riding the backs of these water buffalo, hitting the dog on tails with a machete, cutting themselves loose. They're all milling around smartly, you know, they're running around in circles. Well, the leader, he's got his water buffalo going down the road. I followed him. Wham! Let go of the rocket. No more water buffalo. I, could, I saw the head as we went by. I didn't see anything of him. He might still be running, I don't know. But that was, uh, that was not funny, but it was serious. Mm -hmm. we, got, we got rid of him. So. <laughs> then I called back and told him about it. All right. Uh, now, so you get to the, the beginning of uh, 67 now, your tour is up. Uh, oh, yeah. And so what? what? I went to uh, uh, Fort, uh, Fort Walters, Texas. Mm -hmm. That was a primary helicopter school. And here I am, I'm a platform instructor again. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm teaching from the platform aviation type subjects, also leadership. Uh, military type subjects. And so eventually I uh, was assigned as the director, uh, or by this time I'd made major, I was assigned as director of uh, instructor training. So my job was to train the flight instructors how to deal with, you know, they got the uh, student pilot with them, 
how to, to train them how to work with a student, and also to train other people to be platform instructors. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy, uh, Texas National Guard, I don't know if he's still alive or not. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was a helicopter pilot. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor and uh, way when the big show was going on in way. Uh, and when he came back to the States, he uh, joined the Texas National Guard. They made him a captain. Uh, but we were given him to teach him table manners, how to conduct himself around mm -hmm. people because he was from the back, uh, the back hills. We, we taught him how to pre present himself, how to make a speech, how, you know, and mm -hmm. so we made a, made a, a, a speech, speechifier out of him. That's what he was. That's what he called himself, speechifier. <laughs> now, how long did you stay at uh, Camp Alters? Was that until your next Vietnam tour? Yeah, was, yeah, that was oh about three and a half years, I think. Yeah. I left. Uh, I got there in uh, oh geez, I don't know. early '67. You'd have come home. Yeah, and I would have, yeah, it would have been a month or two. Yeah. And I left there in uh, oh June, June or July. I went to uh, instructor to uh, instrument uh, instrument examiner's course mm -hmm. to be an instrument examiner. And uh, from there is when I went back to Vietnam. Okay. So you're basically there, you're at Camp Walters in, in 1968. A lot of things happened in 1968, and some of them have shock waves that come in and, and affect the military. I mean, you had the Tet Offensive, which affected Vietnam, but you also had increase in the anti-war movement. You had the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. Um, how much of that, if any, filtered down to where you were? Not very much at all uh, that I can I can recall. Uh, I thought when when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, I says, "Oh boy," to myself, you know, mm -hmm. "Look out," because uh, we're allowed to you know really have something going on here. Surprisingly, it, it was it was not, and I think because they caught that what was his name Ray or yeah. Ray or something yeah. like that. Uh, they, they caught him relatively easy, or very soon, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he was given the death sentence, but they uh, commuted it to, to life or something. But uh, I don't recall too much trouble. We didn't have any in that part of Texas. Now, when I'd gone to helicopter school in uh, 61 or something like that, uh, everything was still segregated in Texas. So you mm -hmm. go to the grocery store, or not the grocery store, you go to a department store and there's white uh, uh, water fountains and colored water fountains. Same way with white restroom, colored restroom. When I went back, all of this was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the segregation for all practical purposes was gone. and. Uh, we did not have too much in the way of uh, entertainment in that area. I'm trying to think of. No, we did not. That, not nothing really came, you know, comes mm -hmm. to mind, because it was just a small town, right? And they had had the primary helicopter school there for quite a while. Now it was turning out 500. I think it was 550 a month pilots. These were the young war mm -hmm. officers, and some of them. Some of them turned into be good, good pilots, good, good officers too. I had some some very good ones. Now the warrant officers were often uh, younger, right, than the regular. Most officers. of them, right out of high school, a lot of them. They were good, uh, and some of them, they, if, if the first couple of weeks, they saw that this is not for me. Uh, particularly if they, uh, you know, they got to see some films mm -hmm. and got told about some of the things that happened. Uh, they, 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 their parents, their girlfriend, their wife, don't want them to go through it, mm -hmm. and so they would resign. And uh, sometimes they kept them around, gave them duties to do there at Fort Walter. They, uh, most of the time, they transferred them out. They ended up in Vietnam anyhow. Mm -hmm. so. But I, I, like, there was nothing that really stuck out. You know, to anything to do with segregation mm -hmm. or, or race okay. riots or yeah. anything? Well, I ask because I don't know the answer. 
Yeah, and, and it's right enough, yeah. Stuff. Well, it is an area where you wouldn't have had, you, it's not a big college town, you wouldn't have had a lot of protests no, no, going on, anything know, like that. Uh, and the, near, the nearest uh, place was uh, about like Fort Worth. Yeah. That was a town or anything. What about Selma? Selma, Alabama. That had nothing That's to do with us. Yeah. And that was also earlier. I was in Texas, Fort Walters, Texas. Where were you? Oh, that was Oxford, Mississippi, when we put James Meredith into school. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I was given orders. I was stationed at Fort uh, Benning at the time. Mm -hmm. I was given written orders to to go to Oxford, Mississippi, and take over the airport, take over the airfield. And so I uh, led a little convoy, and uh, we got there. And here's a guy sitting in a little office, a 12-foot square, got a radio in front of him and, and telephones, typewriters. He worked for Southern Airways. I introduced myself. I'm Captain Barry, and I represent the United States government. I have orders to take over this airfield. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a day or two later, all the big shots from, from Fort Campbell, a couple of colonels, and they came in and took over, and that was it. My, my, my claim to fame. <laughs> All right. And so James Meredith was, was the first black student to go first to the University, student of Mississippi, the University of Mississippi. And it required a federal escort to get him in. Or they had some bad, some bad times. Yeah. We had uh, reports of um, the U.S. Marshals were the ones that were controlling him mm -hmm. uh, everything. And several of them were supposed to be badly wounded. One guy was supposed to have taken a shotgun in the face. I don't know. We had to fly radio relay. We had to fly, and we were flying uh, the bird dogs. We were flying the uh, O-1s. Uh, we had radios. The whole back seat back end was full of relay radios. We had big antennas hanging all over the wings. And uh, you went up and you flew for flew circles so that you had contact, or not you, but somebody in, in the, the headquarters below you uh, they were talking to Washington, they were talking to Memphis, they were talking to wherever. And you just flew circles in the sky. And that's how you did it. There were big radio relays. You had to be careful when you landed because some of the antennas stuck down. And if you landed hard or whatever, you're liable to rip the antenna off. <laughs> One guy did. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're going to go back now sort of to your, your main story. So you're, you're in Texas for this period of time. Uh, and then. Um, in sort of latter part of 69. Now, did you want to go back to Vietnam, or do you just go because oh, no, they do. tell you? I was, I, I've been back here. They, uh, some guys volunteer, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I was, heck, I'd go where they send me. Right. And uh, uh, I, I, I got the notice, I uh, got the call from Washington that uh, you're due for a trip back to Vietnam. You ready to go? I said, well, yeah, but hey, how about giving me something on the way? Okay, we'll give you examiner school. Okay, so I went to Rucker for a couple months and mm -hmm. got examiner school, and, and uh, away I went. <laughs> okay. Now, what was your assignment for that second tour? I was assigned to the uh, 268th Aviation Battalion, and uh, there is there is no such uh, position, but we were literally in direct support of the CRID, Capital Rock Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, a Korean, it was Army Korean, Army. Yeah, yeah. The, the Republic of Korea. They had lost uh, most of their division staff in a helicopter accident. They did not want to fly helicopters or, or any kind of resupply, any operations, no uh, troop movements. Now, in the Central Highlands, you've got hills up and down all over the place, almost like, like sawtooth. And their troops are stationed on top of these hills. How are you going to get them supplied? You can't go into every nook and cranny in the valleys. My job was to sell them back on helicopters. Okay, now this area between between the Yellow Sea and uh, the Cambodian border, Cambodian Laos Laos border, uh, part of it was covered by Americans, the Fourth Infantry Division, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the first, no, what did we have? No, that was Capitol Rock, but to the CRID. They had the area from about halfway through the uh, Central Highlands to the ocean. That was under their mm -hmm. 
jurisdiction or whatever their command. And uh, I was supposed to sell them back on using aviation. That meant everything from resupply uh, and particularly operations. It took me about two months to sell them back on a big operation. They had been having a lot of casualties and, and a lot of problems in a certain area. The only way they could get in there was on helicopters. So anyhow, I got together with the Korean uh, counterpart and we worked out an operation and, uh, and, and we, we did a great big success, worked fine, all kinds of prisoners, all kinds of bad guys knocked off, you know, all kinds of weapons. So everything hunky-dory. And two or three months later, we did another one, bigger yet. Hey, everything's fine and dandy. And so I left there with that medal. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So what was it like to work with the Koreans? It was great. They're some of the best troops right now. They were terrible during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. But in Vietnam, they were working with us. Some of the best troops. And I mean, they were mostly draftees. They had, they had their draftees. But most of them, they, they knew that they are going to do a year or two and, and probably go to uh, Vietnam in their case. I had a young uh, Korean uh, sergeant who had lived in Houston, Texas, but he had gone back there and got drafted, but he, he spoke beautiful English. Mm -hmm. He was great. He, I, he worked for me, and between him and, uh, and we had a couple other Korean troops, we worked pretty good. I had a, an American master sergeant that had married a Korean girl, what did they do to the first thing when he got back to the States? They sent him to language school to learn Korean. Mm -hmm. So they gave him to me. <laughs> All right. He retired to Hawaii. <laughs> okay. Now, did the Koreans have kind of a sense of purpose? Did they know why they were there? Well, they were there because they were supporting, they were working with us. Uh, as for their particular uh, reasoning or what, well, actually, there's no place for them to get any advanced training. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they got their training from our man. <coughs> uh, most of the young, uh, most of the uh, officers had been to school, military schools in the states. Some of them had been to civilian schools. They, uh, you, you know, you reach a point where training, training, training will do so much for you, but then you can't get beyond it. And so this was good for them. It was advanced training. Now they may bring, say, a crew of officers in. Uh, for three or four months and then send them back home and send another crew in. And this would keep their, their, their troops up to, up to snuff. That, that was a, a, good, uh, a good thing. Uh, individuals, well, some of them were in a military career. Uh, they, they were the officers, they were working their ways up to maybe being a general. Mm -hmm. Did they see themselves as fighting communism or were they just yeah. building? Yeah, okay. uh, communism. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were against communism. They, they, uh, that was their thing. But like I say, they were <laughs> very, very sharp troops. Their uh, PT, their physical training in the morning, they had sections of rubber tires tied onto four by four stuck in the ground. And they went out and tore those rubber tires up with their hands. They also had a, another unwritten rule. You could tell the senior non-coms. They wore white gloves. Those white gloves never got dirty. And they uh, got their troops moving first thing in the morning, their PT and so forth. But at night comes the guard duty on the perimeter you're going to be in. So you're going to have some troops out there. Well, in some cases, there's only one man at one point. And so he's out there. Uh, they give him a new man. They give him a hand grenade with a pin pulled. In other words, he's got to hold that, that handle down. And if he throws that thing and it explodes, there better be something at the other end. If there's not, they give him another grenade and put him right back where he was. And so they learned very quickly, and they did their, their job, perimeter defense. Mm -hmm. I never heard of one killing himself or anything like that. They were good troops. They were, they were good. What kind of assets did you have when you were supporting the Koreans? How many helicopters or...? We were more or less directly supported by the 129th, which was, uh, well, they, they, uh, they called the, the, the one helicopter that the general used to ride, and they called that the Tiger Wagon. Their, their uh, 
patch was a tiger. Mang, mang Ho, Wild Tiger, and that was it. They called it the Tiger Wagon. They were essentially direct support to this one. But we had uh, five other helicopter companies that we could bring in more. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were having a major operation, we could bring everything in from from the uh, the bird dog spotter planes to just keep their eye on things, uh, all the way up to the flying crane. The flying cranes would bring big loads in artillery pieces and ammo, put them on top of these hilltops, stay there for a week or two, and uh, clean the area out. They would. They cleaned the area, not, not the air. Anyhow, they'd send, they'd send all the helicopters and so forth back in and uh, pick all the stuff up and uh, go back home for a while. I know the Korean uh, brass was happy about it because maybe they didn't lose too many troops and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. They had successful, that was one of my successful operations. Okay. Now, how long did you spend with the Koreans? Almost six months. I, I really could, couldn't pin it down. So they sent me back to uh, uh, Fuloi, nope, that's not right, Tuiwa, Tuiwa. Mm -hmm. They sent me back to Tuiwa, and uh, I was battalion executive officer. We had 4,000 troops. Now, this is not aviation troops. Mm -hmm. We had Clerk, clerk typist, we had finance, we had uh, a lot of administrative type, maybe mm, 1,800, but the rest of them were connected with aviation. I went to talk to uh, the commander over there, who was a finance lieutenant the colonel, about using some of his troops perimeter guard, because I was responsible for the perimeter. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we worked it out, and it was good for his troops, you know, hey, I'm a combat finance clerk, you know. Mm. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, they, they did. The troops, they liked that. They, uh, you know, here they're spending the night out there with the mosquitoes, and next to them is they're working with a gunner or a crew chief or, or one of the uh, maintenance people that work on the helicopters. Mm -hmm. See, these, these, this one thing about Army aviation is we don't have the support on the ground like the Air Force does. And you, you take uh, uh, a, a, a young kid, he's your best crew chief or mechanic, uh, or your, or your uh, armorer, your, your, uh, taking care of your helicopter and your guns. So you fly all day, and then you're going to go on the perimeter guard at night. That's too rough. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd work something out with that finance officer, and we did. So uh, they liked it. And, and uh, he, he, I even bumped into him one night, I'm making the rounds, and there he is. You know. and that, we talked a little. Pretty good guy. Was there much enemy activity around there? Infiltrators. Okay. At night, we had uh, a couple of times, uh, <laughs> we had heard a small explosion. We had a uh, oh, triple, triple concertina, and maybe a little bit more here and there. Anyhow, the infiltrators came in this one night, we heard an explosion. Next morning, they found part of somebody's heel. He stepped on one of these little person, any personnel mines. Uh, two days later, uh, somebody shows up to our medics, got a big hunk of heel missing, needs some medical work done. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, we fixed it. But uh, anyhow, uh, we also called the, uh, the uh, Arvin cops, the Arvin police, the white mice. The, uh, We also had them blow up a helicopter that with a satchel charge. One of the gunships, uh, they got they got that close. They threw the uh, satchel charge into the gunship and blew it. Nothing left. The tail boom hanging there. That's all. And uh, we we did get a couple of prisoners a couple of times. And uh, we what they would do is they would mortar, shoot a bunch of mortars. Mm -hmm. And by the time our people get to, done running around in circles. Uh, then they can move some of these guys in under the wire. And they would not wear clothes. Bare skin with a, with a thong around their middle, carrying their weapon or whatever in their hand, or tied onto that thong around the waist. Eh? We had some, some activity. We had, uh, oh dear, they, oh, they wanted to get to the uh, uh, sky trains, 
the the, uh, the big helicopter. Mm -hmm. They're a bunch of junk. They were always breaking down. We had constant work on them. <laughs> they uh, thought that since they were the biggest, they're the ones that we wanted to watch. And we guarded them anyhow, but we still uh, uh, we always knew that where they were heading. And sure enough, they would head that way. And so we blocking force. And then another time, uh, some hot, sticky, and these perimeter uh, guard posts that we have set up made out of sweaty, sticky sandbags, uh, sand, dirt, whatever, a lot of sweat over the years. And sometimes uh, it was just too bad, too hot, too sticky, and there was no breeze. We had backups. You had a second position, maybe two positions. Move out of that big one into two small ones. And that sort of divided you up. But one night, some of them came through and they did it to two places. They attacked the two empty ones. You know, opened mm -hmm. up with their burp guns and machine guns and what have you. In the meantime, our guys are on their toes. Whap, 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 they got them. <laughs> you know, this is going on. Yeah. yeah. Well, they tended to do a lot of things according to a well created plan, and so they made the plan to target those places, and, and then you didn't cooperate. <laughs> yeah. they, they had some things that uh, they learned from us. Mm -hmm. We supported uh, the early Kong. We supported them during WW2. Mm -hmm. We would go in there uh, <laughs> to help the Chinese. And where did the Chinese learn their stuff? From us. Where did the North, North Vietnamese learn? From us. That's uh, well, they also learned a lot from themselves. They had a lot of oh practice yeah, against yeah. the French. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They uh, had uh, a lot of equipment. The uh, Viet Cong did a lot of American equipment. Mm -hmm. That when the first CAV bugged out in uh, Korea, they left everything from 105 howitzers to all kinds of rifles and ammo and vehicles. They uh, some of it ended up over in Vietnam and. Oh, yeah. You know, jeeps and, and trucks. We had, well, we also sent a lot to the French when oh, they were yeah, in the Vietnam, so they a got a lot too. that way too, yeah. and to, to the Chinese, the nationalist Chinese. So there were oh, yeah, lots of American weapons around from different yeah. eras. Uh, okay, uh, so now, did you have any kind of perspective <laughs> in either of these Vietnam tours of how the larger war was going? Any sense of who was winning or losing? You know, did I have any? Yeah. I uh, figured the politicians should have stayed out of it. Mm -hmm. now, this is a bad thing to say, but I think Westmoreland was a political general. Uh, and whoever was took his place was a Taylor. Yeah. Abrams. Who, oh, Abrams, yeah. He uh, may have turned into one later on, but uh, what I saw about him, I was getting out of the Army about this time. Uh, Westmoreland did not impress me. Uh, so I met some of, some of the commanding officers of some of the other units and divisions and mm -hmm. battalions. Impressed me very good. And uh, well, you've seen that movie that we were soldiers. Mm -hmm. That was all trang. That was bad stuff. But he impressed me. Yeah, how more? Yeah, he was. He impressed me. But anyhow, uh, the politicians. Civilians should have stayed out of it. I'm one of these that believe in about 1948 or 49, when they uh, did away with the War Department and, and put the uh, Department of Defense in, we have, not, we have not won a war since when the civilians started operating it. I would rather have the military <laughs> operate it. Uh, even then, there's still a lot of military that can't find their rear end with both hands. But I uh, did, I was fortunate to either work for some and work with some of the so some of the best officers, not necessarily West Pointers, mm -hmm. and I, I, I really I felt that they should have left their hands on, let the military run it. They're the ones that were trained to do it. Mm -hmm. Where these other jokers, they didn't know they they did everything they could to get their sons deferred from going to Vietnam. Uh, where some of these foreign countries, they have uh, a, a year of national service. Everybody, everybody serves. Even some that are living in the states go back to uh, their their home country and do their year of service. Mm -hmm. And they're not trying to get out of it. And whether they're going to be fighting, uh, fighting uh, like some of the French forces were fighting down in Africa, 
those little countries in there. Uh, but they would go home, do their year of service or whatever. That's the way we should be. Okay. But at the time you're there, you were mostly just doing your job? I was doing what I could. And I, I, one of the first things I, that happened, uh, when, the, the, you mentioned something that brought it to my mind. <coughs> the uh, 8 to 5 war. Uh, they, they were not uh, f f flying missions before 8 o'clock. They were heading home at 5 o'clock. And now, uh, how are you going to run a war like that, 8 to 5 war? I was on my way uh, from one point to another, and I heard a guy on the ground. I, I always did this in, in uh, Vietnam the first trip. I always tried to contact the guy on the ground. You need any help? You need anything reconned or something like this? I did that. Uh, other people did it too. But uh, I used to tune the radios and listen. If I heard a guy on the ground, and, you know, he needed some help. If we could do it, if we had the ammo to do it, we'd do it. Uh, if, or sometimes I could call somebody else to do it. But anyhow, I, I heard this helicopter pilot, the guy on the ground said he needed something. He needed some ammo and water. Ah, you can't quite make it. I've got to get back to the base right now. And I'm not supposed to be flying after a certain time. Well, I talked to him on the radio. I don't think the radio worked ever after. But I, I put the word out. To, when I got back to that headquarters, that, that I put the word out. I don't ever want to hear anybody turn down a guy on the ground who needs help. Mm -hmm. And that's what our job is, is to, to support that guy on the ground. And I can say, I'm a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so now, as this second tour of Vietnam comes to an end, um, you're now kind of getting to the latter part of 1970. Uh, are you now looking to get out of the Army? Or? I've, yes, I've put my paperwork in. I'm getting ready to retire at the end of my 20 years. I spent uh, like a, a little over 20 years. And so, uh, but what, uh, what I did, I was assigned to, uh, at that time, Camp Drum, New York. And that was a good job. It was the uh, training, training for the National Guard and uh, Reserve for Northeast United States, from as far down as uh, uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania, and, and the reserve. And they would come in in May and finish up. Uh, oh, it was the end of September, early October. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, one of the, to me, one of the best training areas available. They recognized this now. You wouldn't believe the place. But I worked with the. Uh, I, I was the director of plans, training, and security which was, you know, we only had like a hundred and some people. And we took care of it. When, when the uh, uh, Guard or Reserve was coming in, they would send people from different places, active duty places or reserve units, and fill the place up with support troops, so to speak. They would bring in airplanes and helicopters, they, they, and they could run the various problems that they were using. We were in the process of building some rocket launchers, some rocket uh, some uh, rocket uh, firing areas where they could have the helicopters firing the rockets, and naturally inbound, not, not outbound. <laughs> okay. Now we have just gotten to the end uh -huh. of my last tape.